Hi, I'm Derek Thompson. I'm a senior editor at The Atlantic and the author of a new book, Hitmakers, The Science of Popularity in an Age of Distraction. And you're listening to The Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions. And this is The Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals in the video production, filmmaking, television, and music industries. Derek Thompson is the author of Hitmakers, the science of popularity in an age of distraction. And together, we break down the patterns in popular music, TV, and movies to discover the science of storytelling. The Go Creative Show is supported by our friends at Kessler, making innovative tools for filmmakers. Visit them at KesslerCrane.com. Rule Boston Camera, buy, rent, create at Rule.com. Newshooter.com, essential news for real-world shooters. Heads from Act, the fastest way to back up media. And PremiumBeat.com, premium, royalty-free music and sound. I am so excited about this episode. I love episodes like this. We really take a deep dive into the, the structure and the foundation of good storytelling. There are so many patterns in storytelling and also, you know, in music and movies, TVs, it's not just stories, but pop culture has so many patterns to it. And um, Derek Thompson has done an amazing job of pulling these all together in his book, which is fantastic. Uh, we talk about a lot of them, but of course, not everything. And I strongly encourage that you buy this book. In fact, we uh, have a giveaway. Uh, we've got two copies of the book to win uh, for our Go Creative Show listeners. So if you tweet us at Go Creative Show, uh, very simple, just tweet us the message, hit makers, hit makers. The first two people to do that will get a free book. How about that? Super simple. So tweet us at Go Creative Show uh, and just tweet us hit makers. That's it. You win. First two people. Uh, but so much coming up with Derek. Um, and I know you guys are going to love this one. Uh, because I think a lot of the skills that we will discuss and a lot of the patterns that we'll discuss can be super helpful to you as you are creating your own stories, but also as you are pitching ideas to clients. Um, these are the types of things that you need to make your uh, projects more compelling, and we talk a lot about that, and it's coming up in just a couple of minutes. But before we get there, Rule Boston Camera has one of our longest and most favorite sponsors. We love them all. But Rule's been there since the beginning, so we have a very special spot in our heart for them. And the reason we do is because, personally, I buy tons of equipment from them. I'm always renting from them. But if you don't want to spend any money at all, Rule also offers free education. What do I mean by that? Okay. They have events called Learning Labs and Pub Nights. And these are free events where they bring on specialists to share information to give you hands-on experiences with equipment. Uh, and it's all within like the production world. So it's cameras and lighting and um, how to mix uh, better audio, how to color grade, just everything you can imagine. There's hundreds of videos on their Vimeo page. They're all free and they have events pretty much monthly. And lately they've been streaming them live on Facebook, uh, which is another great way. So between a live stream on Facebook, seeing it in person for free in Boston or watching it on their Vimeo page, you have no excuse to uh, get some great free information from Rule Boston Camera. Their next one is Wednesday, February 22nd. It's a free event called Shooting with Drones. Who doesn't want to learn more about this? There's so many out there, and we all need to know how to use these things. Shooting with Drones, it's going to be live streaming on Facebook, or you can see it in person at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, February 22nd. And if you can't do either of those things, no worries. They're going to post it on their Vimeo page shortly after. And um, you can get there by going to rule.com, R-U-L-E.com, and uh, clicking on learn, and it's all there for you, rule.com. And lastly, Hedge for Mac. I love Hedge for Mac, and I use them on every set. And the reason why is because it's the fastest application for importing and backing up media on OS X. It's simple to use, but it's extremely powerful. You can import multiple sources and send them to multiple destinations all at the same time. It's optimized for files 100 megabytes or larger. It's faster than the Finder, and it's built for video, photo, and audio in mind. Okay, And if that's not enough, really what it comes down to is peace of mind. When my camera operators, directors of photography, audio people, when they give me files, and oftentimes on my own DIT, I need to copy those, and then I give the cards back to these people, 
and they format the cards. And is that not the scariest thing in the world? You want to make sure that your media is backed up. And what Hedge for Mac will do is it's going to back it up. It's going to back it up correctly. It's going to uh, verify that everything is done correctly. And it's super fast. What else can you ask for? So there's a free version at hedgeformac.com. H-E-D-G, uh, I'm sorry, H-E-D-G-E-F-O-R-M-A-C.com. And that's great. And you should check that out. But don't even waste your time with it, honestly. It's only 100 bucks. Get the full version. It's worth every cent. And if you go to hedgeformac.com forward slash go creative show, you get a 20% discount. So what is stopping you? Do it right now. You're going to love it. Hedge for Mac. All right. It's time for our spotlight. Derek Thompson. Derek Thompson is the senior editor at Atlantic Magazine and author of Hitmakers, The Science of Popularity in an Age of Distraction. Derek and I discuss the trends in popular music, television shows, and films, and explore the science of storytelling. Is there a formula to good storytelling? Why do people say they want new but really want familiar? We tackle all of this and more. Plus, how to use popular storytelling techniques to create better proposals and more effective pitches to help you get your projects sold. So I'm here with Derek Thompson. He's the senior editor of The Atlantic Magazine, and he's also author of his first book, Hitmakers, The Science of Popularity in an Age of Distraction. What a great title and what a perfect time to write this book. <laughs> Derek, thank, thank you very much. Thanks so much yeah. for being on. Yeah, it was it was a great pleasure to write. I had so much fun uh, reporting the stories from entertainment, talking to academics uh, for the theories to apply to these stories. Uh, it was a blast to write. So I, I just hope it, it's as much fun to read as it was to work on. So this is your first book. So it, were you sort of t toiling over the idea of what am I going to write about? Or is this something that just hit you immediately and you're like, let's do it. Now's the time. Oh, yeah. I mean, there is a, a very full trash can of ideas for books that have never materialized. Uh, that may materialize in the future. Um, this is definitely the most uh, broadly applicable book that I was thinking of. You know, I, I wanted to write a book about, I read a lot about economics for the Atlantic magazine. And so I had several ideas for economics books about measuring productivity and uh, the jobs of the future. But I kept coming back to the idea of like attention. Like I'm really obsessed with the science of attention, why we pay attention to some things and not other things. Um, and exploring the question of attention through hits in pop culture seemed like a really fun investigation to me. And so uh, that's why I, I settled on it for, for a book. Well, what did you find? I mean, what did you find about our attentions and where they land and why? Yeah, the, the seven word thesis of the book is that familiarity beats originality and distribution beats content. Mm. Uh, when it comes to popularity, I think a lot of people, a lot of uh, creative people want to believe, A, that that their inherent originality is their key selling point, and B, that the best stuff is just self-distributing. Um, if you make a great movie or a great uh, you know, web video or write a great song, that its greatness uh, is its destiny and that it will self-distribute. It will go viral. You don't have to work on, on marketing or distribution as much for a product um, that's already great. And the fact is that you know you just look throughout pop culture history and you look at the products that succeeded the most and they all benefited from extremely well-planned distribution. Um, so yeah. that in many ways, distribution uh, is more important than content when it comes to building something that is truly popular. And then for, for the first part of the thesis, you know, I... I think that some of the, the greatest works of art uh, that appeal to the broadest number of people, whether it's in movies, music, television, always had this element of keen familiarity, sort of sneaky familiarity. And I call this concept familiar surprises. These are new ideas, new products that are original, but they're genius is that they open up a door to familiarity that we don't expect to walk through. But then we, we, we enter uh, uh, an experience that feels recognizable and understandable to us in a way that we didn't expect to feel. Um, and I call this moment the aesthetic aha, this, this moment of meaning creation um, uh, that, that is devised by marrying surprise and familiarity. Um, and th that, that is, in many ways, the, the single most important idea in the book. Why do you think that we want things to be familiar? 
Well, why do we crave that as, as humans? Yeah, well, I think we crave both surprise and familiarity. I think, you know, you, to, to be almost evolutionary about it, uh, you know, the, the, human, the human species didn't just stay in Africa. It didn't just stay in the Middle East. It kept exploring. It moved into Europe. It crossed the Bering Strait. It moved down through Panama. Uh, we are an exploratory species. But if you look at what we like, it's actually extremely conservative. Mm. We, li- we find out what we like and we stick to it. We are creatures of habit. So we're crossed with um, this, this need for discovery and this extremely conservative taste. Um, and so that's really the tension that I think lives at the heart uh, of our minds is that on the one hand, we are what I call neophilic. We love new things. We love new songs, new movies, but we're also very neophobic. We hate anything that's too new. And ultimately, we just want to find new things that remind us of old things. Um, and so I think that's a really powerful concept uh, for devising new songs uh, and new stories. I'd love to kind of take this concept and spread it across the different areas that our audience are working in. Um, you know, I was mentioning to you before the show, the people that listen to the show primarily are, you know, artists in a whole bunch of things. They're, they're making movies, they're, they're writing music, um, they're screenwriters, script writers. It, there's a lot of storytelling going on. And um, I'd love to kind of take this idea and talk about storytelling across a bunch of different mediums. And I want to start with music because I'm a music guy. I've been learning more about you. It seems like you're a music guy as well. I am. And um, one thing that I was, the last thing I was reading before our, our uh, interview here was this idea about Discover Weekly on Spotify. Yeah. I thought that was really fascinating because I am, I know exactly what you're talking about with this. I did notice that old and familiar songs popped into this uh, playlist. But just to kind of get everybody up to speed, what is Discover Weekly and, and what is the story there? Yeah, I'm glad you asked this. This is this could be one of my favorite stories from the book. Um, Discover Weekly uh, is a product on Spotify uh, that dumps 30 new songs uh, into a playlist for you that you can access on your phone or computer uh, every single Monday. And initially, when they're designing it, they really wanted it to be entirely new music, all new songs, all new artists. But when they were testing it internally, there was a bug in the algorithm that accidentally let some old songs into the playlist from familiar artists. So they fixed the bug. This isn't what they wanted. They wanted it to be all new. So they had to fix the bug. But what happened when they kept testing it after they fixed the bug? Engagement with the app absolutely collapsed. It turned out that having a little bit of familiarity in Discover Weekly made it a much more popular product. And so this is just a perfect example and a perfect metaphor for the way in which we do we need a little bit of familiarity in new products. And sort of the evolutionary psychology explanation for this, this need for a little bit of familiarity, it says, you know, if you're um, uh, a, a hunter-gatherer roaming the savanna in Africa and you see an animal or a plant that you recognize, that's a great sign that it hasn't killed you yet. So you should like that plant or animal a little bit more. You should have a preference for the familiar. Um, but it's really interesting to think about how to essentially design it into new products. It's fascinating, that one in particular, because people are actively subscribing to that playlist because they want new stuff. Right. It, and right. You, you'd think that of all the people in the world, those people would really value new things. I'm a subscriber of that playlist, too. And I got to tell you, when you listen to that many new songs each week, you're kind of just like, you're kind of over it. You're like, ah, I just, it, it takes up so much of your listening time to hear all new stuff that it becomes almost like a burden. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's no, weird. exactly right. And, and a burden, burden is a great word to use because it is burdensome to deal with something that's too new. Like think about how exhausting it is to, um, I don't know, if, if, if your audience, you know, travels a bit, to, to travel to a new country that you, where you don't speak the language, where you can't read the signs, you can't read the maps, you can't converse with people. Think about the first few days in that new city and how exhausting it feels at the end of every day yeah. to constantly deal with novelty. That's an experience that we have with culture 
all the time, right? Audiences see new movies sometimes that don't connect with the familiar story structure. And they say, this was just, it was too burdensome to deal with. There's some new song, some electro pop song that has, you know, seven, five, time, seven, five time signature. And it's way too difficult to listen to. And, and someone who's not used to that, uh, that timber or time signature will say, God, it was so burdensome to have to listen to it. So we need a little bit of both. We need to be stimulated, of course, but we also need something to hook onto where we can say, aha, this is, this is opening a door to the familiar so that I know where to step in. I know that this product knows and understands me. Clearly music styles change over the years, but it's, it's sort of like when it does, you, you almost don't know when the music style changed until you start hearing the parodies of it. Like, the, <laughs> like right now what I'm hearing in every pop song is that like, I don't even know how to describe it, but there's like this weird sound that I first started hearing in Justin Bieber's um, latest stuff, maybe from like two years ago. Yeah. I, but now it's in everything. I don't know what that sound is, but it's like this weird, like higher pitched sort of twirly sort of sound. And oh, it's, and it's, in, it's in everything. And I'm like, is this because the same producer's doing everything or it, it, Well, first of all, it could absolutely be that because, uh, you know, as, as other writers have, have documented perfectly well, uh, uh, pop songwriting has uh, concentrated in such a way that Max Martin and a lot of these Swedish song doctors, you know, will work in tandem to write these songs. And they'll often, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll write a song for Justin Bieber, write a song for Katy Perry, for Taylor Swift, and they'll share what's working across their artists. Um, you know, I think there was, <laughs> there was an article uh, last year that talked about um, uh, what they called the millennial whoop uh, in music, that there was a lot of like, Whoa, yes. Whoa. And like every, like it was in the Lumineers, it was in Katy Perry, it was in Justin Bieber. It, like everyone was using the millennial whoop. And, you know, what's happening here is obviously the complete opposite of too much originality. This is just m mimicry, right? This yeah. is, this is, this is uh, musicians saying, We've learned that this millennial whoop is working for Justin Bieber and these other artists. Let's just put it into our song. Um, but this is a really interesting lesson uh, for, for this interaction between familiar and surprise. Because on the one hand, you know, if you want to connect with the biggest audience possible, you should, of course, study what's successful. But the very nature of a popular uh, timber or a popular um, shtick like the millennial whoop it's popular. It, 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 the fact that it became a hit will eventually serve as its demise because too many people will use it for their own songs, and then people and then audiences will habituate. They'll say, "Okay, now I've now I've realized that everybody is using this exact same uh, technology." Uh, it's it, this definitely happened with sort of um, you know uh, the, the sort of the rapid drum machines in the 1980s with the hair bands. Like everybody heard it and they were like, okay, this is, I, I've had way too much of this. So again, you have to go back to this marriage, this tension of the familiar and surprise and say, in particular with something like, you know, a, a, a Justin Bieber um, uh, a sort of tick or a Justin Bieber styling to say, if I'm a set, if I'm an artist like who's right in Justin Bieber's wheelhouse. Like, you know, I, I'm a, let's say I'm a tenor who um, writes, uh, you know, uh, a sort of hip hop pop um, that's a little bit moody and a little bit catchy. Um, if you can't just, you can't, it, it, it's not very original and it's going to be really transparent if you rip off Justin Bieber, if you're essentially Justin Bieber. But what's interesting is when you can genre blend is when you're, say, you know, a, a country rap star and you say, this is working really well with Justin Bieber. What if I use it in my work? And then some people who are used to hearing this sound in hip hop pop start to hear it in country rap. Then they say, oh, that's an interesting new way to use this familiar styling. And that, I think, is a part of the, the, the sort of the, the popularity uh, code, is this ability to smartly use what's working in a, in, a, in a barely adjacent area and adapt it for your own purposes. Now, that handles the familiarity side. Uh, but talk about the rock around the clock story, because that really handles the distribution side of this and how that wasn't necessarily, well, it, it, not necessarily, it wasn't a hit. And then all yeah. of a sudden it became. It's an interesting story. Can you just kind of briefly let us know what that's all about? Of course, yeah. This is one of my favorite uh, 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 stories from really music history is uh, the story of Rock Around the Clock. Um, you know, we to set this up a little bit, I think that we want to believe that if a song succeeds, 
its success was destiny, that it was meant to succeed, that it was just too catchy not to, to hook on to lots of people. And I know that you know, your, your audience and, and our listeners right now are, are a lot of creatives, but I know that, that my peer group, journalists, love to be able to explain every cultural phenomenon as if it were inevitable, yeah. right? Trump's victory was inevitable. Where we are as a country in politics and culture was inevitable. Um, but the story of Rock Around the Clock really challenges that thesis. Rock Around the Clock comes out in 1954. It is a B-side to a song called 18 Women that's absolutely terrible. And that no uh, one knows. Either. That no that's one has ever part. heard of anymore, right. <laughs> um, it comes out. It gets radio airplay, it gets marketing, publicity. It's basically ignored. People have a chance to hear this song and they say, no thanks. So Rock Around the Clock was a failure. And we might not be able to sing a single line of it if not for an incredibly serendipitous series of events. Peter Ford, a 10-year-old boy, buys the album and he gives it to his father, Glenn Ford, who's a movie star. Glenn Ford is starring in a movie called Blackboard Jungle. Glenn Ford, the movie star, gives it to his director, Richard Brooks. Richard Brooks, the director of Blackboard Jungle, puts the song, Rock Around the Clock, at the beginning of his movie, in the middle of his movie, and at the end of his movie, Blackboard Jungle. And it is only then, in 1955, when Blackboard Jungle comes out, that the song becomes number one in the country, the first rock and roll song to ever hit number one and the second best-selling record of all time. Mm. So what is, So the question is, is Rock Around the Clock a good song? Well, in 1954, it was a flop. In 1955, it was one of the biggest hits in culture history. So I think the, the lesson of this story is A, that we live in a probabilistic world where there is chance and where even your best work requires perseverance and the understanding that it might not click immediately, even if you think it's absolutely perfect for your audience. But two, distribution matters. When the song was just on the radio, it was a flop. When it was in a movie about juvenile delinquency, it was the biggest hit of the century. So, you know, another story that, that a modern example of this is, um, you know, remember the fun song, We Are Young? Yeah. Yeah. So We Are Young, uh, you know, fun had, had not had a tremendous amount of success. Um, we Are Young was out. Uh, the album had been out for, I think, a few months. And then it appears in a car ad with a bunch of, I think, bouncy balls or balloons if, in, during the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl goes out to 115 million people watching con concurrently. It's a massive uh, element of, of cultural distribution. And only at then does it become the number one song in the country a few weeks after the Super Bowl. And then Billboard, one year later, named it one of the 100 most successful pop songs of the last century. So again, we are young. It was the song sounded the exact same when it was being both ignored and when it was one of the biggest pop hits of the of the century. And the lesson here um, is that consumers don't exactly know what we want, and sometimes we need distribution to instruct us. And so this goes again to the first lesson of the book, which is that often distribution is just as important, if not more important, than content in determining popularity. And distribution has changed quite a bit um, over the past decade for sure with social media in the way that things are being shared now. You don't have to wait till the song pops up on the radio. You don't mm -hmm. have to wait till a movie's even released in a movie theater. I mean, yeah. people are releasing on iTunes before it goes out into theaters. Um, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the new modern distribution, how it's changed the way that things become popular. Um, it's a complex story, but the simplest way to summarize it is to say that broadcast power used to be aristocratic, and now it is democratic. That is to say, in the 1950s, 1960s, even through the end of the 20th century, um, only a handful of uh, institutions truly had the power to reach tens of millions of people at once. Um, there were a handful of television channels, a handful of radio stations. And as a result, for a cultural producer, uh, your goal was very simple. I have to hit one of these radio stations or television stations. Um, but now that the, the broadcast power has democratized, 
There are podcasts and newsletters that reach more people than radio stations and newspapers. Um, so there are individuals who have greater broadcast power than legacy institutions. So what does that mean for someone in our audience, for someone who's a creator? It means that finding the perfect place um, to drop your new piece of content into is both easier now that there are a lot more broadcast channels, but it's also actually more difficult to find that one channel that's going to reach all the people who are your perfect audience. And for that reason, I just suggest to people who are, you know, making a new web video or, or you know, writing a, a new uh, a, a song to say, you should probably spend more time thinking about distribution and marketing then you even thought thinking about the content if you want it to be as big as, as, as possible. Because you really have to work hard to find, all right, where are the people who are right for this product already arrayed where I can reach them in one fell swoop? I can reach them with that one blog post, that one podcast, one newsletter. Um, and in that sense, you're essentially employing a broadcast strategy, not a viral strategy, which says that great stuff self-distributes um, and great stuff is inherently contagious, but a broadcast strategy that says, where is my audience already arrayed so I can hit them with one blast? And that requires a lot of work and research and begging some cultural producers to, to support and broadcast your stuff. But it is so, so important. What are your thoughts on this term influencers? Uh, you hear a lot about that. I do. I work a lot with ad agencies, and I and the idea of an influencer is is something that is always talked about. Uh, people want to get their ideas into the hands of these influencers, almost more so than traditional media outlets. Um, and oftentimes, these influencers are very, very young. They could be teenagers. They could just be YouTube celebrities. H how? Where are you seeing the shift uh, now in distribution to these individuals? Uh, yeah, I, I have to be honest. I, I kind of think that the popular myth built around influencers and easy virality is kind of BS. Mm. There's just not a lot of quantitative evidence that suggests that these individuals who are sort of uh, perfectly placed within whatever, the information cascade, um, are reliable to distribute information. Um, here's what we know works. What we know works is that broadcasters with a certain with a certain size of audience reliably convert um, uh, uh, sales um, and views uh, and clicks. Um, that you know, no one talks about. Let's say. You know, I work in journalism, so it's much easier for me to talk about my own industry. But hopefully, uh, you know, people who are listening can 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 adapt this lesson for for their own. Sure. Um, you know, if I want, I, I read for the Atlantic Magazine, uh, all you know, already a fairly widely read publication. But what we know is that for us to get something to go really, really big, it's really useful to have it reach the top of the Huffington Post, for it to reach the head of the, the top of Reddit or dig, or even, you know, if it's a certain kind of article, the top of drudge. That drives a lot of people very reliably, all at once, to the story. Now, someone who might, you know, whose friend maybe might have seen it at the Huffington Post, um, they, their friend might share it on Facebook, and three people might click on that, on that link on Facebook. And one of those three people who sees it on Facebook might say, wow, this article went totally viral. Now, like, kind of it did. Yes, it was shared a few times by, you know, people who, who don't have massive followings. But the most important mechanism by which that art, my article went big was that it hit the Huffington Post homepage. Mm. And that's a broadcast. So does it really make sense to think of the Huffington Post as an influencer? I don't really think so. We, we tend to, to reserve the word influencer for exactly what you said. People who aren't Oprah people who don't have quantitatively massive followings, but we somehow build a myth around them that says that they are influential in qualitative ways that can't necessarily be measured in quantitative followings. And my advice, having talked to data scientists and people who study the information cascade, the map of an idea getting big online, what I think the smartest data scientists would tell you is give up this myth that there are magical influencers living amongst us. Believe in the numbers. 
believe in the fact that some newsletters are larger than others, that some homepages have more audience than others, and try to hit those large broadcasts with your product because those are the ones that will reliably uh, convert um, ordinary people into uh, audience members and consumers of your product. You are listening to the PremiumBeat.com Song of the Week. It's called Ocean Ride by Tiny Music. PremiumBeat.com is where to go for all of your royalty-free music and sound effects. They've got a great website where you can access a collection of thousands of royalty-free tracks for as low as $49 each. And the best part is, is you don't just get the one track. No, 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 no. You get cut downs. Most of the tracks have a 15, a 10, a 30. You even get a loop set on most of the tracks as well. So you have customization beyond anything you can imagine. (laughs) You can take all these tracks and fit them into your project perfectly. And that's just one of the reasons I love them. The big thing is that the quality of the music is great. I love the music. My clients have always loved the music. And the price is right. Premiumbeat.com. Head over there. You'll love it. I know you will. And lastly, let's talk about Kessler. The Kessler Shutter Dolly is the latest innovation in camera dollies and finally provides filmmakers with the performance and versatility dollies in its class have always lacked. Until now. The shutter dolly utilizes standard speed rails and can be operated manually or in conjunction with Kessler's motion control solutions, CineDrive, and Second Shooter Plus. For more information, visit KesslerCrane.com. Now, obviously, you guys know who Kessler Crane is. I mean, let's be honest. Everybody has used or owns Kessler equipment, but that shutter dolly is really, really cool. And if you haven't checked it out or used it yet, I strongly encourage you to. And there's all sorts of videos and training about how to use it and what it is. And it's all there at KesslerCrane.com. We love those guys. And we strongly suggest you go and check them out because they've got great stuff. All right. I haven't had enough of Derek Thompson. You haven't had enough of Derek Thompson. So here we go. We have a whole nother portion of our interview, and it's coming up right now. Let's talk about movies. Um, Split, M. Night Shyamalan's movie, very popular. In fact, Vice News Tonight, my one of now my favorite uh, news outlets. I absolutely love that um, that uh, show. They did, they basically talked about your book through the concept of the movie Split and how there's familiarity in horror genre across the board. I mean, this idea of split personalities has been uh, across countless movies and many of them have become hits. Can you give us uh, a little bit of insight as to how having familiar ideas and concepts are valuable in the horror genre? I mean, obviously it can go across all different things, but we don't have hours and hours to talk. But let's talk about that. Sure, yeah. Um... You know, I, I think that that in many ways horror is among the the easiest genres to break down, right? Um, that there are there are some ghost movies and there are some demon movies, and the demons are sometimes summoned or sometimes they uh, are inflicted on uh, the main characters without them wanting to be to be uh, haunted by or or attacked by a demon. Um, and so, and in, in each of uh, these sort of micro genres, there's very different audience expectations. Um, that, for example, audience members want to put themselves in the shoes of the main characters, and so it's easier for them to identify with protagonists um, that are randomly haunted by a demon than those that summon a demon, because there a lot of people might think in the audience, "Well, I would never summon a demon. I would just be smart enough not to do that." So, so, and so the the problems they're facing are their own fault because they summoned it. Right, exactly. Right, exactly. They, they brought this on themselves kind of thing. So it's not as scary because they start off the movie thinking, they're not me. These protagonists, these teenagers are not me because they've made some stupid decision that I would never make. Hmm. Um, and it's not relatable. Um, you know, one, but one of the really interesting ways I think that, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of storytellers, you know, who have read, uh, you know, Save the Cat and they've read um, uh, Joseph Campbell, and they understand that there are sort of these macro narratives that you're always working within. Um, the question then, of course, always becomes: All right, how do I how do I adapt these sort of meta narratives for my own story, for like my own truth? You know, a lot of times I think people are are motivated to become artists because they have this sort of deep emotional reservoir that says, "I I need to to share um, my story with." 
people. And, you know, a really good example of the, of the marriage of sort of familiar structures and, and new, really original and emotional storytelling is, is uh, the new film Moonlight. Um, you know, Moonlight in so many ways is this unbelievably brave, original, novel, poetic movie. Um, but here's what's really interesting about it to me as someone who's fascinated by the invisible patterns in art. Think about the classic romance or romantic comedy. It's always a three-act play. Yeah. In the first act, uh, the, 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 the two people uh, meet each other and sort of begin to explore each other. In the second act, they fall in love. They have a moment where maybe they kiss or they sleep together. But then at the end of the second act, some traumatic event will push them apart, pull them apart. And then in the third act, in all these romances and all these romantic comedies, they find a way to come together and there's this emotionally cathartic reunion um, that powers, that, that sort of is, is the, 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 the critical attractor of the movie, where everything is headed. Now think about Moonlight. And I'm sorry to spoil it to, to a certain extent for audience members who haven't, who haven't seen it. We covered, is, we covered it on the show anyway, so great. I'm, I'm sure people have been seeing it. Well, then I, I, I hope that, that many listeners, uh, including you, are sort of nodding along as I describe the, uh, the classic formula of romantic comedy. This is exactly how Moonlight is structured. It is literally a three-act play. Each act is announced by with a new name for uh, the main character. Um, they meet. He. He. The. The, the young men meet. Uh, they seem to fall in love in the second act. A traumatic event pulls them apart, and then there's a reunion. Now, in no way is Moonlight anything like a romantic comedy. It is. It. It. It plays with romance in a very oblique and smart way, and it's definitely not a comedy. But I think one of the reasons why it's so emotionally resonant is that it, it's this brave story that is nonetheless suited to this extremely familiar romantic arc that allows audience members to see, many of them for the first time, a black gay romance in uh, the cinema. But it's structured in such a way as to be beautifully familiar. Um, and so there, I think, is just a lovely example um, of how you can be brave and artistic while nonetheless intuiting the necessary familiarities of your audience. Sort of like how you could hear 10 different songs. They all have the exact same chord structure, but you may not even know. You just, right. it, it, they all sound different, but if you break it down into chords, they're all the same. It, it, you hear that a lot. Yes, I mean, right. I mean, Bob Marley's No Woman, No Cry and you know, Lady Gaga's Paparaz Paparazzi and uh, Journey's um, uh, Don't Stop Believin'. All the same, you know, uh, what is the C, G, A minor, F uh, kind of chord structure. Um, it, but they're all so different. I mean, they are such different timbers, different instrumentation, different, uh, very different uh, singers. And, you know, sometimes people will look at the fact that these chord structures are so um, common among popular songs and say, well, the songs are merely derivative. It, it just proves that music is derivative. But I, I see it a different way. The purpose of music is to make people feel something. Yeah. Why else would you sing? Why else would you work so hard on this art except to infect people with emotion? And if it's true that people are made most emotional by that which is sneakily familiar, by that hidden door that opens up to reveal the truth they've always known, then of course you should use familiar chord structures. It, I think of it not as, you know, tracing the same lines, but rather plotting new routes home, um, finding new ways to reach uh, the, the same emotional resonance. Um, so I, I'm a huge uh, fan of, defender of, you know, smart derivation, uh, smart stealing, smart co-opting and, and bundling of, um, of never before bundled illusions. Um, I, I think that's in many ways where genius lives. Now we have, we certainly have learned a lot uh, about how familiarity is important and valuable and can really help you get your ideas out there. Uh, a lot of the people in our audience, uh, and myself included, we're always trying to get things made. You know, we have an idea for a commercial, we have an idea for a short film or a song. You need other people involved to get these things made. You need to pitch your ideas to a council most of the time. How can we use these tips and this sort of this strategy to try to get your ideas sold. Not even, I'm not even saying get your ideas to become popular among just the general public. I'm just saying getting past that first hurdle to get funding, to get 
you know, a client to agree to do something. What can we do to, to help that process along? The short answer um, is that studio heads and music label heads and scouts, these experts are nonetheless dealing with so much stuff to decide whether it's good or right that you simply have to begin by by intuiting their need for familiar oversimplification. That the only way they're going to understand your idea is if you frame it in such a way that they are going to get in three seconds um, because you framed it familiarly. Mm. So th- there's this great study that I talk about in um, uh, that actually... Uh, comes from the science world. You'll very quickly see how this how this clicks into your question. But it comes from the science world, and these uh, these scientists from Harvard wanted to know what sort of papers were mo- most likely to get funding from the NIH, from the National Institutes of Health. And they realized that they 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 purposely coded the papers to be some of them to be really really novel ideas, some of them to be really really familiar ideas, and then others to be sort of familiar with a twist ideas. And what they found overwhelmingly was that even at the NIH, right, some of those brilliant scientists in the world still had a very clear taste for ideas that were optimally familiar, not too new, not too old, a little bit of both. And so this clicks right into the concept of the high concept pitch, right? The idea that, you know, I'm pitching a movie, it's Titanic, but it's not, it's, it's Romeo and Juliet on the ocean, right? Or uh, The Secret Life of Pets. This is Toy Story, but for animals. Mm. Um, you see this in the venture capital community all the time, this extremely important need to take this this beautiful new product that you've worked on, this beautiful new app, and reduce it to three words, right? eBay, when, um, I'm sorry, uh, Airbnb, uh, when it was first launching, they, they decided to market themselves as eBay for space, right? eBay for space, that's what we are. This incredibly successful thing that's for this slightly new thing. You see this in, I mean, it's become a cliche in, in Silicon Valley to say, I'm Uber for X, right? I'm Uber for Y, and so yeah. the key, I think, is to is to find a high concept pitch, to find a three or four word summary that is, you know, X meets Y, um, a familiar X uh, for new ca- product category Y. To find that high con- concept pitch that that isn't <laughs> and to, to sort of mix genres here that isn't the millennial whoop, right? Yeah. Don't go for the high concept pitch that's so derivative. Everyone says I'm Uber for X. Everyone says I'm Airbnb for Y, all right? That's, that won't work for you. That is clearly a two-stayed. Um, but to find some very, very quick way to, to explain to people whose job is to, to uh, look over a thousand new products a day, um, this is why my product is both clearly new, clearly original, and yet it begins from a square one of familiarity so that you will understand it and so that you will understand immediately where my audience lives. When I'm pitching ideas to clients, I've found that my most successful pitches are when I have meetings with the clients before we pitch. And the reason for that is because oftentimes I'm taking their own words from the meeting about what they're looking for, incorporating it into my pitch and giving it back to them a week or two later and it's not being sneaky because I don't know what they want until they tell me. But yes. b- for some reason, when I'm able to almost give them back what they told me, but incorporating a, a, a visual aspect to it, uh, it always works. And the, the pitches that are the hardest and that oftentimes don't make it is when I don't have that time ahead of time. I think that is so well put, and I couldn't agree more. Two points that, that I, I just wrote down as you were saying that. One is that um, th- there are chapters of the book where I, where I discuss how in many ways, um, you know, the first step of making things that people love isn't creativity so much as anthropology, um, studying your consumer base and figuring out what they already like in order to make something that snaps onto their familiarities and habits. And what's so interesting is that you're saying, I basically am doing just that for the producers, for the venture capitalists, for the studio heads and, and institutions. I'm meeting with them and studying their idioms and their familiarities, and then packaging that into a pitch right back to them. 
And the second thing that I wrote down um, is uh, I just wrote down the word Atlantic because um, when I am advising uh, new writers for the Atlantic, uh, when they say, you know, I want to write a pitch for you guys, I want to have an internship, get a fellowship, what's your piece of advice? My piece of advice is that I say, this sounds um, crass and it sounds simplistic, but at the end of the day, the Atlantic wants new writers that just get us, right? And it's difficult to define that word get, but in many ways, you, Ben, just defined it. To get someone is to speak their language. Mm. It's to hear their idioms and give them back to them. Um, it reminds me really quickly, sorry for the quick diversion, um, uh, Stanford uh, uh, data scientists found that the, I, they did a headline study on Reddit. What's the best way to write a new headline um, uh, to get it the most clicks? And they said, to express a new idea in familiar idioms, right? To, 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 to describe a new, a new concept in a way that is incredibly familiar for your audience. That's exactly what a great pitch is, isn't it? Yeah. A great pitch for a new song or, or web series is a brilliant new idea that is instantly understandable in the idioms of the person that you're pitching it to. Um, and I tell people who are applying to The Atlantic, I say, understand how we talk. Read our articles. Understand how we write. There, there's not a formula to an Atlantic piece, but, but there's a clear pattern. We love big idea plus historical ballast, historical sort of underpinning, plus a bit of future prescription, right? Here's an article about what Donald Trump just did. Here's a little story about something that happened in the early 20th century that's a great way to understand Trump as a, as a, a political creature. And then here's how it can help us predict what he's going to do in the future, right? That is the, that is the ideal Atlantic article pattern. And so when people are pitching Atlantic articles to us, I'm like, understand our formula, right? Like, read us, get our formula, and then pitch us new ideas in our formula, and what's lovely about what you, your story is that that's exactly what you're doing for, um, for companies essentially that have money to help distribute your ideas, is you're meeting with them, you're understanding their patterns of thought and speech, and then you are injecting your ideas into those idioms and saying, I figured out the way you talk. Here's a new product in your language. I had no idea how genius I was. <laughs> you were genius, Ben. <laughs> Lovely work. <laughs> the book is called Hitmakers, The Science of Popularity in an Age of Distraction. Um, really great book. Such an interesting topic. And you're clearly fantastic on the air. What are you doing behind a computer? You should be on air all the time. Oh, I, I, if, if only you could see me uh, at, at the moment. Um, I, uh, m my hair is an absolute mess, and uh, I don't have uh, any of my TV-ready makeup on. Um, <laughs> so I'm very, very grateful, in fact, that I am uh, doing this from, from behind a screen. But may, can, maybe, maybe next time I'll, I'll show my face. I'd love that. Where, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you, your book, read more of your stuff? Sure. I, will, I, I would encourage them to buy the book. Hitmakers is available everywhere books are sold. Um, uh, that They can find me on The Atlantic, uh, Derek Thompson at The Atlantic. And then on Twitter, I tweet at from DK Thomp, T-H-O-M-P. DK Thomp um, is my Twitter handle. Um, and I would welcome them to follow me there. Absolutely. And we'll put links to all of those things in the show notes as well. Derek, thank you so much for being on. What a great guest and a fantastic book. And it's your first one. First Unbelievable. One. So well, I, I'm interested to see where you go next. Thanks, man. Do you want a free book, do you? Oh, have I got a gift for you. The first two people to tweet us at Go Creative Show with this simple message, hit makers. First two people to send that to us will get a free book and uh, all the rest of you, just go and buy it. Just go and buy it. It's awesome. And the information you're going to get from this will be incredibly helpful to you as you pull together your pitches, proposals, and write your stories. It's all there and you should check it out. I want to thank Matt Russell who is behind the scenes tinkering away, making sure that this, that this show sounds so super delicious. And he does it episode after episode. You can find him at Gainstructure.com and on Twitter at Gainstructure. And you should reach out to him to mix your video projects because he's going to elevate your video projects by making the audio sound delicious. I want to thank our sponsors, Hedge for Mac, Rule Boston Camera, Kessler Crane, NewsShooter.com, PremiumBeat.com, 
Without these people, the show wouldn't exist. And that would be sad. So support those that support us. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.